I played every Street Fighter game, here's my thoughts. Do I really need to go into what Street Fighter is? It's one of the most prolific fighting game franchises ever, and what I'd consider a staple to the entire gaming industry. This is part one of a two-part series where I play every one of them and give you my thoughts. Two things really quickly before I get into it. First, I really want to thank my patrons, including That's Ash and Megan Solo Q League of Legends was a mistake in the Played Every Game tier, along with the absolutely awesome people that you see on your screen here. Second, I'm gonna be at PAX West this year, and you can too. PAX West has actually given me some badges to give away to my audience, but I'll talk more about that later. For now, let's get right into the games. Street Fighter was initially released in arcades in 1987. The version I'm playing here is on PC through Capcom Arcade Stadium. So in order for this to make sense, let me really quickly explain how the Street Fighter games work in general. For this explanation, I'm gonna explain how the games normally work, and then I'll tell you what the first game does differently. The vast majority of the games in this video are arcade games, and this means that the overall experience will be a straightforward arcade mode experience. You put your coins in, select your character, and then you fight a series of increasingly difficult versus matches. You usually earning points toward a high score for landing first hits, special moves, and winning in specific ways. By default, every match is a best of three, meaning that you need to win two total rounds to continue on. If you lose the two rounds, you get a game over and you have the option to insert more coins to continue. Also, at any time up to a certain point, a second player can hop in by inserting their own coins and pressing start. Street Fighter 1 is a bit different in that you don't actually get to choose your character and use Ryu by default. You can technically play as Ken if you're the second player and win in the first fight against the first player, but after that he still just plays identically to Ryu, so there's not much of a difference. The controls are incredibly straightforward. Movement is done with the control stick, and you can move left, right, press up to jump, press down to crouch, and hold back to guard. There's six total attack buttons with three punches and three kicks, light, medium, and heavy for each. This control scheme is actually carried forward in every single future game. Yeah, they figured this out pretty quickly. But in another notable twist, the original version of the arcade cabinet for this game didn't have the standard six-button control layout that we see in most fighting games. Instead, it had a two-button setup with pressure-sensitive buttons that you could just kind of punch as hard as you wanted. The harder you press the button, the harder the attack in the game. You could, for all intents and purposes, punch the button really hard over and over again and see that punch reflected in the game. From what I can tell, though, this version didn't do so well and was a bit obtuse. And while I wish I could try it myself, I can understand why they didn't try this again. Finally, all these games have special moves that vary per character and can be done by inputting a mixture of control stick movements and specific button presses. For example, with Ryu, a quarter circle forward press followed by any punch attack activates his Hadouken, which is an energy blast move. Quarter circle back followed by any kick activates Hurricane Kick. These special move mechanics are actually present in Street Fighter 1, but they do not feel good to do at all. I'll speak more on that in a second. Alright, now that I've explained how this game works, let's get into it. First off, the visuals. This isn't an amazing looking game, but this is also the late 80s, so it's not bad either. The character artwork looks pretty nice, actually. While some of the stages are kind of bland and undetailed, they don't look bad by any means, just a bit static, I guess. My only real gripe with how this game looks is just how bland the menus and transition scenes are. Everything is just sort of against a black background. I mean, I'm sure this is more of a hardware limit than anything, but that doesn't mean I can't use my modern standards to whine about it a little bit. But, uh, to get into the gameplay, it's, uh, very rough, at least compared to what I'm used to. First off, this game is hard! Like, seriously, it is wildly difficult, and that has a lot to do with how weirdly unresponsive it feels to connect attacks. I'm gonna be real with you, most of my wins here, if not all of them, were just me cheesing the fights with leg swipes, which the AI seems notoriously bad at avoiding, or just barely being able to run out the clock with more HP. Oh, and sometimes, somehow, managing to pull out special moves. Speaking of special moves, they are shockingly hard to pull off in this game. In any other Street Fighter game, I think I can pull out a Hadouken almost 100% of the time. But with this game, it's so finicky. From what I can tell, they intentionally didn't show players how to use these special moves on the machines or in any kind of guides, and hoped that people would discover them as like a fun little secret. But on the flip side, they do feel way more powerful in this game than any other game, especially since I managed to finish off a couple of the earlier enemies with like a single Shoryuken. There was also this one time that I was able to defeat someone by just mashing directional inputs to repeatedly use a Hadouken followed by a Shoryuken. But like, it's so weird and inconsistent to pull off these moves. I wasn't able to, like, rely on them or anything. Sure, I could try to mash buttons every time, but that's less of a strategy and more of a Hail Mary. Either way, I ended up having to save Scum a ton here, and the rewind feature in Capcom Arcade Stadium became my best friend for a lot of these fights.
So when you actually do complete a fight, you get a neat little victory animation followed by a quick text blurb between the characters. Well, normally. In this game, it's an audio clip and it's the same voice saying the same thing every single time. At some points between fights, you'll get a special little bonus stage, and there's two total. A stage where you have to time the little power gauge to break tiles. Excuse me? Um, you can see that I hit that, right? Like, you can you can see that, right? In one bonus stage where you're just breaking planks of wood. In these bonus stages, you get points depending on how well you completed the stage, which are added to your total high score. The enemies you fight in this game are unfortunately not at all playable for some reason, but they do include a shockingly large cast of characters, most of which you never see again after this game. Once you've defeated everyone and completed the game, you get to input your name and see it right next to your total score. You also get a fun little victory scene, too. I love that you see not only like a list of everyone that you fought, but it's the art of their beat up faces. And for this victory, you become king of the hill. Is that still a thing in the newer games? Is Metro City powered by propane? Also, the credits here are a bit wacky and everyone's name is in a uh, fight words, I guess. You've got Punch Kubozo, Short Arm Sago, and Strong Take. The first Street Fighter is an interesting game. Mechanically, it feels really sluggish and not at all natural, but at the same time, there is an interesting element of charm to it. It too. Unfortunately, that charm is wrapped in an incredibly transparent example of the arcade money-making strategy with its ridiculous difficulty. I'd bet this game devoured enough quarters you could melt them down and make a metal statue of Ryu the size of the Empire State Building. Now, would I recommend this game? I don't think I could give a definitive yes or no on that. It's an important game solely because of its incredible legacy, but the game itself hasn't really aged well in my opinion. Because of that, I would really only recommend it so you can experience firsthand just how far both the series and overall fighting game genre has come. Street Fighter 2 was initially released in arcades as Street Fighter 2 The World Warrior in 1991. After its release, it got a plethora of updated re-releases, each adding extras like new characters, balance changes, graphical improvements, and an increased speed version with Turbo. This is something that most of the mainline Street Fighter games have done since, and with the re-releases, there are also additional new story elements too. The version I'll be playing for this game is Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, which was originally released in 1994. First, let's talk about the visuals. While the game the game's visuals looked a little bit different from its initial release versus the version I'm playing now, I still think it's a massive step up from the first game either way. The characters, for example, don't have a ton of animation frames, but they don't really need it because they look pretty good and your brain kind of fills in the gaps. Know what else looks better? The stages, which are a huge upgrade. Not only do they have tons of detail, but there's this use of this like multi-layered parallax which gives the illusion of depth. And there's a bunch of dynamic and animated elements everywhere, like the spectators in the background. What I find super interesting impressive about all of that is that there's so much cool stuff in the background, but it never feels distracting. So before I get into the full gameplay changes, I want to go into a little bit of detail about what sets this version of the game apart from previous versions. The Super Turbo version of Street Fighter 2 has adjusted movesets for all the characters and includes a new super combo mechanic. What's neat is that there's a hidden way to use the previous unchanged versions of the characters by inputting these little character specific codes on the menu. Not only does this change their balancing, but it's also a way to use their original color schemes. Compared to previous versions of Street Fighter 2, this game also adds in the Turbo feature. Well, it's less of a feature and more of just the game's speed. Street Fighter 2's original release had a much slower gameplay speed, but in the Turbo versions, you now have four speeds. There's three selectable speeds from the character select screen with a fourth in the operator menu. Apparently, the Turbo speeds are slightly different depending on whether or not you're playing the English or Japanese versions of the game, but I'm not entirely sure how much they differ, and I'm playing the Japanese version for reasons I'll explain later. This game is the introduction of the gameplay style that we see in pretty much every future Street Fighter game, and arguably every other mainstream traditional fighting game too. You now have the ability to link attacks to create combos, use a button input to grab and throw an opponent even if they're guarding, and of course, an actual roster of characters each with their own distinct movesets, combos, and special abilities. On top of all of that, Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo introduced Super Combos, a powerful special move that requires a full super meter and usually a slightly more complicated button input too. You can fill the super meter by connecting attacks 
attacks, but if you use your super combo and it gets blocked, you still use the entire meter. It's a great mechanic and definitely the kind of thing that I take for granted nowadays since it's something that we see in virtually any modern fighting game. As far as the actual roster goes, this is probably one of the most iconic character rosters of all time. The characters you see here are like the core of Street Fighter, and all of them appear again multiple times in future games, sometimes even in games outside of the Street Fighter series. Another mechanic this game introduces is Stun, a status effect that kicks in if the character is hit a bunch of times in quick succession with a strong combo. This dazes the victim for a couple of seconds, leaving them completely open to attacks and can pretty much end a fight if it happens at a bad time. This game in general feels incredible to play, especially with the turbo speeds. Movement is so responsive that you kind of just sink into a trance where you almost feel like you're controlling your character with your mind and not buttons. On top of that, learning a new character can be thrilling, frustrating, or a combination of both. Everyone feels distinctly different, but it never feels too daunting to try to pick up a new character outside of your comfort zone. Of course, some characters do have somewhat different play styles, like grapple and zoning focused characters versus something like an all-rounder, but it's never too jarring of a change in my opinion. Though, how the hell are you supposed to pull off Guile's super combo in this game? Here's the input. Seems simple enough, right? But I sat there for over an hour trying to get this damn super combo out using a PlayStation 4 controller. I, I just couldn't do it a single time. And sure, it's probably way easier to do in a real arcade stick, but they kept this input in for a long time. In fact, some of the games I'm talking about in this video series was for the PlayStation 1, and they used the exact same input. I would also just chalk this up to me being bad, but I got a friend of mine who has a lot more experience with these games than I do, and he couldn't even do it. Anyways, let's move on. Bonus stages do return in between fights in this game, but they're weirdly absent in the later versions of the game, including Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo. This is actually kind of shocking to me, considering how iconic the car punching bonus stage is. It's kind of a shame to see it missing in what's widely considered to be the best version of the game otherwise. After that, it's pretty much how I explained it. You clear fight after fight, and you get these cool little transitions that actually have different character lines versus the same thing over and over again, but no voices this time. Now, I do want to point something out. The English arcade release of this game is significantly more difficult than the Japanese arcade release. And this isn't just my imagination, it's actually very noticeable, and if you have the means, I highly recommend comparing it for yourself. The easiest difficulty in the English release actually seems comparable to me to the hardest difficulty in the Japanese release, if not harder. Was this an attempt to get more quarters at the arcade, or was it some kind of weird developer balancing oversight? When I was researching this, I couldn't actually find a direct explanation as to why they did this. So if you have any insight on this, please let me know in the comments. So anyway, Street Fighter 2 is a masterpiece. It really is. Yeah, it's kind of old, and the visual style is clearly limited by the hardware it was developed for, but that honestly doesn't matter all that much in a game like this. It feels incredibly responsive and great to play, and while I tend to suck at these kinds of games, I still enjoyed playing it. On top of that, this is such a huge improvement over the first Street Fighter game, it doesn't even feel like it's in the same series. To me, this is what I'd consider the first Street Fighter game that actually feels like a Street Fighter game. It's just in a completely different universe in how it feels to play versus the first game. I'd recommend this game to anyone looking to get into the series because it still holds up ridiculously well today. Plus, every future Street Fighter game, for better or for worse, has its own little extra gimmicks, and I'd argue that this is probably as pure as it gets as you're looking for a 100% straightforward zero gimmick fighting game experience. Street Fighter Alpha Warrior's Dreams, known as Street Fighter Zero in Japan, was released in arcades in 1995. Visually, this is a pretty major step up from Street Fighter 2, at least in fidelity in my opinion. The artwork is more detailed, the character animations have more frames, meaning it feels a bit smoother, and the overall look is just improved. I also like the refreshed art style and the seamless menus too. There's not a single moment that feels like a loading screen in this game because they just mask it super well with the menu transitions. Also, going back to the art style, it's pretty unique and it makes the the Alpha series stand out from other Street Fighter games. This game expands on Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo's super combo system by making the super gauge a three-part gauge. While this expanded gauge increases the utility of super combos, it can also be used for a new mechanic called an alpha counter. This is a move that can be activated using a special input while guarding at the cost of one super gauge. It's almost like a parry and can actually get you out of a tough spot. Another new defensive addition here is the ability to guard while in the air. If you're jumping and you hold back, you can block air attacks. What's funny is that air blocking can only be done in the alpha games and Marvel vs. Capcom, and you'll never 
ever guess who got super reliant on them while he played the alpha games, then had to forcibly stop himself from doing it in the future games. Definitely not this guy. A big offensive addition is chain combos. These are combos that are done by canceling attacks into other attacks by quickly pressing the attack buttons. This gives you a much smoother and I guess longer combo. I'm a pretty casual player, so this is one of those mechanics that would probably make me even better at the game, but I never fully learned how to do them effectively. A couple of small improvements include rolling recoveries from knockdowns and the first use of victory counters showing you how you won. What I mean is that the icon changes depending on how the winner of the round landed the last hit, with special icons for using stuff like super combos or grabs. The character roster in this game is pretty large and varied and includes a few new additions like Charlie Nash or Guy from Final Fight. When you select a character, you can select between manual and auto mode. Manual mode is the standard gameplay, while auto mode is a slightly simplified mode where you automatically guard attacks up to a certain number of times and also can pull out a super combo with a slightly easier button input. The trade-off though is that your super gauge maxes out at 1 instead of 3 bars. After selecting your mode, you can select between standard speed and turbo speed, a mechanic brought over from the turbo versions of Street Fighter 2. This game includes a few secret characters too, which are Akuma, M. Bison, and Dan. These characters can be chosen from the character select menu by using highly specific inputs. On top of characters, there's a few secrets beyond that too, like being able to change the arcade mode into a single fight against a super powerful Akuma, or having a two-player fight with Ken and Ryu against M. Bison in a nod to the Street Fighter anime. In this M. Bison fight, you and your partner actually share a single health bar and a single super gauge. That makes this already challenging fight significantly harder, especially if one of us is way worse at the game. I find this addition really cool though, especially since it's a one-off thing that actually does something different with the gameplay mechanics that you don't see anywhere outside of this one fight. Street Fighter Alpha overall feels like a newer and cleaner Street Fighter 2 with a brand new art style that kind of takes the series in a different direction but still stays true to what made Street Fighter 2 special. Would I recommend Street Fighter Alpha? Yeah, I think so. It doesn't stray too far from what made Street Fighter 2 fun, and the stuff like alpha counters that they added in don't feel like they take precedence over the basic fighting mechanics that you need to master. Street Fighter the Movie was a 1994 action movie adaptation of the game, starring Jean-Claude Van Damme as Guile, with most of the Street Fighter 2 cast represented in some form. The movie got two video game tie-ins, one for arcades and one for home consoles. Let's talk about the arcade version first. Aesthetically, this looks like a weird Mortal Kombat ripoff, but mechanically it feels like a strange Street Fighter clone, almost? Like the controls feel very familiar to what I've gotten used to, but the timing just feels different to me. It's hard to explain. Lane. The mechanics, for the most part, are the same as we saw in Street Fighter 2, but somehow things just feel off. I don't know if I'd feel this way if I hadn't just played Street Fighter 2 though, and I could be influenced by this jarring change in visual style. I do kinda like how the stages have this realistic but stylized look, just like early Mortal Kombat games. They even have what sound like voice clips from the movie's actual actors, and it sounds pretty goofy, but in a charming and campy way that I really love. What I don't love though is the super distracting foreground scenery that's great on paper, but makes it pretty difficult to see what's going on in some of these stages. It'd be nicer if the foreground elements were at least semi-transparent or something. The game's roster is made up of most of the classic characters you'd expect, plus a couple of movie-specific characters. Their movesets mostly match the versions of the characters from Street Fighter 2, but with the addition of a couple of extra super moves. As far as gameplay goes, this game weirdly does feel a lot like a normal Street Fighter game, but it definitely feels off in a way and much faster paced, weirdly enough. The changes in animation and style do make it feel a little bit different to the previous games, but the character movesets again are mostly intact. This game does have one one pretty unique mechanic though in that it has a regen ability. Characters can regenerate some of their health using a button input at the cost of their entire super gauge. It's kind of a cheesy tactic, but I guess I can see what they were going for here. There are some unique mechanical changes under the hood that this game has, but I couldn't really showcase a lot of it because I was fighting for my life with this game. The difficulty here isn't in the CPU reading your moves or anything, but in just how insanely fast everything moves and how much airtime everyone has, I just couldn't get used to it. And even the more more grounded fights felt really difficult, and I'm gonna be honest, I just couldn't make myself learn the ins and outs for this specific game. Don't get me wrong, I planned on trying to learn, but then I encountered this fight with Akuma, and let me just say, f this fight. Holy sh this fight. As of recording this voiceover, I've played every single Street Fighter game for a few hours at least apart from Street Fighter 4, and let me tell you, there is not a single fight in any of the Street Fighter games that came even close to infuriating me as much as this single fight did, even with excessive save scumming. 
This fight single-handedly made me decide that you couldn't pay me to play this game anymore. I finished the game one time out of sheer spite, and I have no desire whatsoever to revisit it. Let's move swiftly on to the console version. This version of the game was ported by Capcom themselves for the PlayStation and the Sega Saturn. In Japan, they called this version Real Battle on Film. This version retains the general look and style of the arcade version, but with some minor differences. For example, the effects for special moves more closely resembled the traditional Street Fighter art style, and the voiceovers seem to be freshly recorded lines from what I presume are the original voices of the characters rather than the movie actors this time around. Visually, the quality of the characters and environments are noticeably lower. The clarity of the characters is just muddier, and there's definitely a lot fewer frames of animation for their moves. That being said, this doesn't really bother me, and you eventually stop noticing the difference. In fact, this look makes it feel more like a normal Street Fighter game, and the game otherwise looks fine overall. No worse than a typical game in this weird digitized human style. You can also see a lot of blue spillover on the characters from the background blue screen, but for some reason I actually kind of like this. It makes the game feel even weirder than it already is. Plus, when you're in the character select screen, they straight up just use the blue backgrounds for the selection animation, and I'm gonna be honest, I, I respect that. As for gameplay, this one feels shockingly like a normal Street Fighter game, which after that arcade version, I welcome with open arms. The weird regeneration mechanic is totally gone, the speed is toned down to a far more manageable level, and the wild aerial focus seems to be absent. It actually almost feels like a clone of Street Fighter 2, to be honest. This game does add a special move mechanic called Super Specials, which are just powered up versions of normal specials that can be activated once you have at least half your super gauge. Outside of that, though, it's definitely Street Fighter 2. But, since this one's on a home console, we've got modes. The modes are Movie Battle, Street Battle, Versus Battle, and Trial Battle. Movie Battle is a branching story mode featuring Guile as the main character. So listen, full disclosure, I haven't seen the Street Fighter movie since I was like five, so my memory of the plot is super fuzzy, but it seems to kind of sort of follow the story beats, maybe? It's got little cutscenes with text dialogue and still shots from the movie, and at times you have the option to select how you want to proceed. This seems to actually affect the path that you take toward the ending, kind of? I don't know if this is the case for every branching option, but it definitely looks like sometimes it just changes the order that you do the fights, but it's still neat to have that little bit of player agency built in, I guess. On top of still shots from the movie, sometimes there's also actual little scenes from the movie, too. The audio is replaced with the game's soundtrack, but I dig the style. It really works for this kind of game. Oh, and this little FMV talking head thing? Love it. It's charming and a reminder of a bygone era where this was actually a super common thing to see in narrative games, and there's just something about seeing this in a Street Fighter game of all things that's super novel. Moving on, Street Battle Mode is this game's version of the arcade mode, and for the most part, plays exactly how you'd expect. You select a character and you fight a series of AI opponents, and it looks like you fight them in the same order every time no matter which character you choose. Next up is Versus Mode. I couldn't play this mode, mainly because it looks like you have to have a second player. No AI enemies, unfortunately. It looks like you could select a username, though, which is pretty neat. I don't think we're really missing much not seeing the Versus mode, though. You can probably imagine what that looks like. Finally, there's Trial Battle Mode. This mode, I don't fully understand. It feels like a way harder arcade mode that then judges you using a star system when you lose. I truly have no idea what any of this means, but what I do know is that Zangief looks really sad. So these Street Fighter movie games are a bit of an outlier in the series. They don't seem to get much recognition. It's actually to the point where, honestly, I had no idea these games existed until I started doing research for this video. That being said, I kinda get it. They're 90s time capsules that really don't feel relevant anymore. Everything that they offer can be gotten in other Street Fighter games, even the ones that came before it. The main thing going for these is probably the unique aesthetic and the novelty of the movie it's based on. Street Fighter Alpha 2 was released in 1996. I'm gonna be real, this game looks a lot like the first Street Fighter Alpha. It's got an identical aesthetic and art style all the way down to the user interface and even the transition scenes. But that's not a bad thing, it still looks great and clearly they were confident in the style and they had every right to be. It looks awesome and is probably one of my favorite visual styles in the entire series. Gameplay wise, it looks pretty dang similar again and really it is, but there are some tweaked mechanics and new introductions. The chain combo have been removed in this game in favor of a new custom combo system. If your super gauge is above a certain amount, you can activate a custom combo, which to me, as a casual player, feels more like a buffed up super mode. This makes your attacks come out way faster with significantly less wind up and cooldown. This is a super powerful mode with really flashy effects that eat up your super gauge, but it's also really risky since it can be shut down simply by being hit one time during it. My favorite thing about the custom combos though is that I can actually tell that I've done it correctly, unlike the chain combos. When playing through the standard arcade fights, there are 
optional secret rival boss fights you can do, but getting these requires you to complete certain hidden requirements. If you manage to win five matches with either a super move or a custom combo before you get halfway through the game, you're able to take on a boss. With these fights, you get a little dialogue lore scene before the fight, and while I have absolutely no idea what's going on in the overall story of these games, that is still a neat touch. There's also a Shinakuma fight that you can trigger that has even more difficult and specific requirements, but I am nowhere near good enough at these games to fulfill them. Like the first alpha, there's a handful of secret characters that you can select using codes in the character select screen. These are Dark Ryu, an alternate version of Ryu with a different moveset, Chun-Li with her Street Fighter 2 appearance, and outright Street Fighter 2 versions of Dalsim and Zangief. These Street Fighter 2 versions don't have the super combo meters, nor can they do any of the new stuff from Alpha, like air blocking and custom combos. It's a neat addition, and I'm sure someone out there prefers these versions of the characters. It also feels almost like they were testing the waters for the isms that we see in Alpha 3, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So Alpha 2 really just feels like a more refined version of the first Alpha, something Capcom seems to excel at with their follow-ups. However, the differences are kinda subtle and hard to see if you're a casual player like me. If you showed me footage of Alpha 1 and told me it was Alpha 2, I honestly couldn't really tell the difference. But someone who plays these games on a competitive level most likely could. In fact, how many of you noticed that you've been watching Alpha 1 footage since I first brought this up? I bet very few of you. The custom combo system is neat and definitely my favorite addition though. It's much easier to know that I pulled off something cool with custom combos than with the subtle chain combos from the first game. At the end of the day, Alpha 2 is a lot of fun and it feels great to play, but I'll hold off on making any grand statements about the overall Alpha series until I've talked about Alpha 3. Here we go, the first big crossover. While this is the first Marvel and Capcom crossover game, this isn't the first Marvel fighting game made by Capcom. In fact, this game takes a lot from a couple of previous dedicated Marvel fighting games. I won't be getting into the non-Street Fighter games too much in this video, but it is worth pointing out. This game has a lot of flashing lights. Visually, this game matches the fidelity of the Street Fighter Alpha games with its animations and overall smoothness in my opinion, which is great because I loved Alpha's flow. The Street Fighter characters fit in super well with the X-Men characters and the overall all aesthetic works, so it's never jarring or weird, and honestly, you don't even really think about it. The biggest difference between this game and a normal Street Fighter game, though, is the amount of color and poppiness that this game has. Everything feels way more colorful and flashy, and I don't just mean the constant screen flashing effects. Everyone's moves feel bigger, more colorful, and almost sparkly? The game really does pop, for better or for worse, and while I don't dislike it, it did almost give me a headache when I played it in a dark room. As far as gameplay goes, the game's biggest departure from the standard formula is the addition of tag team battles. When you play this game, you play only one round, but you play with two separate characters. You can play one at a time, tagging out your other character at will using a button combination. This actually is the standard format going forward for pretty much every crossover Street Fighter game. Switching characters can be done at basically any time, and when you tag in your character, they come in with a flying air attack followed immediately by a taunt that can't be avoided. This means that if the initial entry attack misses or is blocked, that taunt is a free moment for the opponent to deal a free blow on you. However, switching a character has the added benefit benefit of allowing the character that you switched out to recover some of their HP over time. The amount that they can recover is indicated by the red segment on their HP bar. This adds a bit of strategy and thought to the tag-ins that's deeper than just switching back and forth willy-nilly. The overall gameplay feel is kind of hard to describe, but it feels a lot looser than a standard Street Fighter game. Everyone feels lighter, almost. Plus, a lot of the inputs to perform special moves feel like they've been changed, so jumping into this with muscle memory can be kind of a pain. It's not something I dock this game any points over, though, given how different it already is. One of the the coolest features here, though, is the ability to perform team super combos. This has you and your partner coming in and doing an insanely powerful combo together to deal even more damage than you could alone. I love character interactions, and while they're not unique per character in this game, it's still something I will always appreciate seeing in games like this in any form. Oh, and there's also this double jump mechanic in this game, which leads to a lot more fights having a sense of verticality that you don't normally see in Street Fighter games. I'm personally not a fan of this, but I don't know if it's because it changes how the game plays or if I just just don't like change. Maybe it'd grow on me if I spent a lot more time with the game, but really it just feels like it puts more focus on aerial moves and counters, which are things that I'm already bad at anyways. The character roster is really nice. It's got some staple Street Fighter characters with a couple of newer additions like Charlie Nash, and the X-Men side has its staples too. Cyclops, Wolverine, Rogue, Sabretooth, and while not playable, even Apocalypse makes an appearance as the final boss. Speaking of the final boss, this game does something really neat for the Apocalypse fight. You're not fighting him straight on in a classic matchup, no. 
you're fighting his drill arm while he stands ominously in the background. You can hit him and his arm at the same time, but you also have to juggle fighting these little drones that keep on appearing over and over. You can technically ignore them, but they fire projectiles at you that really chip away at your health. This is a challenging but very fun fight, and it's really cool that they opted for this over, I don't know, a traditional super strong M. Bison or something. The character that you use to deal the last hit to Apocalypse is the character that you take into the next section, meaning that you can only get one character ending per run. After you beat Apocalypse, you get a one-on-one -on -one fight between your winning character and the secondary tag-in character. This is an awesome way to top off the game. I love how the climax is set up, and it makes all the fights that came before really feel worth it. Oh, and if you win with Charlie Nash, the ending has a neat cameo from Charlie's friend. Super mysterious. They should bring this friend in as a playable character in a future game. That'd be sick. So as is tradition, there's a couple of little secrets, like the secret character on the select menu. The one secret character here is Akuma. In order to unlock him, you have to go to the character select menu and enter a super complicated. Oh, you just press up. Neat. So I've got to say, I think I have a unique perspective here because I've been playing all of these Street Fighter games back to back. Because of that, it's made these games honestly feel a bit stale. With this game though, not only is there a novelty in seeing a whole bunch of recognizable characters with the addition of the X-Men cast, but the addition of new characters in general makes this feel a lot more fresh to me. I've been seeing pretty much the same roster over and over with only a few differences so far, which is fine on paper because they're solid, iconic characters. But in my unique circumstance, I will accept this breath of fresh air with open arms. My final verdict on X-Men vs. Street Fighter, though, I like this game overall, and I think its only flaw, at least in my opinion, is how much looseness and verticality it has. Some people might see that as not a flaw, but instead a trademark of this game and something that sets it apart from the standard Street Fighter games, so your mileage may vary. Outside of that, I think this game is fine, and I do respect the bold stylistic differences. Street Fighter EX was originally released in arcades in 1996. It got an arcade-only updated version, followed by an even further updated PlayStation version called EX Plus Alpha, which is what I'm playing here. And for the record, the EX games were all published by Capcom, but developed by Arika. This is the very first 3D Street Fighter game, and naturally, it has a wildly different visual style. Personally, I think this game looks fine and reminds me a lot of stuff like Soul Blade and the older Tekken games, especially given that they're running on the same hardware with the same blocky character appearances. I can't can't complain about this. The stage environments, though, they, uh, they exist, that's for sure. These stages are completely flat environments that endlessly move with the characters, which is totally fine, but the backgrounds are literally just flat, static images. This is pretty disappointing coming off of some of the most beautiful dynamic stage backgrounds I've ever seen from previous games, and while I get that it was probably some kind of technical limitation at the time, it makes me wonder if the switch to 3D made that big of a trade-off worth it. On the upside, the presentation of the menus and transitions are really nice, and the character artwork is beautiful as always. It's an overall solid-looking PS1 game if you can ignore the ugly stages. Gameplay-wise, they actually managed to keep the gameplay of previous Street Fighter games almost entirely intact. Ryu in this game feels almost exactly like Ryu in Street Fighter Alpha, believe it or not. Well, outside of his kick being changed to Dan's kick for some reason, there have been a few presentation changes like grabs changing the camera angle and the camera just being a bit more dynamic in general, but none of that affects the gameplay itself. Oh, and this game does the cool replay thing when you win a battle, which is something I actually forgot that a lot of fighting games do. I guess it wouldn't really work in a 2D game, so it's neat to see it here. And I did say that this game's dynamic camera doesn't affect the gameplay itself, but there is one exception. There were a couple of times where I used my super meter to charge up a super combo move, but then the game's camera did this fun little transition and completely canceled out my combo because the camera moved, I guess. I couldn't make it happen consistently since the camera movements can't be predicted, but that was a pretty annoying thing to have happen, especially during the later, more challenging arcade mode fights. So the character roster is pretty varied and includes a bunch of returning characters along with a handful of new characters like Skullamania and Kaidi. This is pretty impressive to me because not only did they have to adapt the classic 2D characters to a 3D game space, but also create entirely new characters in 3D that still meshed with the original cast. I like the variety overall and will always welcome new interesting characters, thanks to the insane power of the home console. This game has a variety of modes. The modes are Arcade, Versus, Team Battle, Time Attack, Survival, Practice, and Watch. So at this point in the video, we know what Arcade, Versus, and Practice mode are going to be, right? I won't get into too much detail about those, but I do want to point out that the arcade mode endings have fully 3D rendered cutscenes for each character, and echoing what I've said before, these are great and feel a lot like the stuff that you'd see in something like Soul Blade or Tekken. Team Battle Mode has you choosing five total characters to pit against five of the opponent's characters in a series of one round matches. If you win the fight against an opponent, they move on to the next character and vice versa. You also recover all of your HP between rounds too. As you can see, I did incredibly well here. Next up is Time Attack Mode, and this is just a mode where you select a character and try 
to battle a series of pre-selected opponents in one round matches as quickly as possible. Survival mode is similar to time attack, but instead of completing it as quickly as possible, your goal is to finish as many fights as possible with only one health bar. If you win a fight, you recover a little bit of health, but it's not always enough to replace what you lost. Finally, there's watch mode. This is a super simple mode where you pick two AI characters and watch them fight, almost the equivalent of an arcade cabinet attract screen. The main difference is that it's customizable and with wild and sometimes disorienting first person camera angles. I don't know how many people are watching AI battles in games like this, but I guess you could technically use this mode to see how the characters could be played. Even then though, the camera angles make it pretty difficult to see what's going on, so I really don't know. So there actually are two more modes buried in the practice mode, and these are the expert mode and bonus game. Expert mode is sort of a challenge mode where you pick a character and then you're tasked with performing 16 progressively more precise and complicated combo inputs. I got pretty far into reuse, but I hit a huge wall toward the last couple. This is a really cool mode for learning how to cancel into supers and connect combos properly, but oh boy is it hard. It also seems like this mode is how you unlock the hidden characters too. While I was originally gonna try to do it legit, I elected to just use a cheat code to try these characters out. Bonus game is a little mini game where you have to break these barrels as they roll toward you. The barrels have different properties depending on their colors, which seemingly just boils down to how many hits it takes to break them. If a barrel hits you, it knocks you down. You can't take damage, but since there's a time limit, every knockdown is more time you're spending not hitting barrels. So Street Fighter EX is a strange entry for sure. While it's not bad by any means, it did try to do some different things that may have led it to being shrugged off by hardcore fans at the time. Mechanically, it definitely feels similar to something like Street Fighter Alpha, which I mean as a compliment. That being said, it doesn't really do much that wasn't already done by previous entries, like Alpha. I mean, the new 3D style is novel, but the novelty wears off pretty quick when you realize you're just doing more of the same. I've played like, what, almost 10 Street Fighter games now? And we're not even to the 2000s yet? And there were multiple fighting game series coming out at the same time? It makes me wonder if maybe some of the reason we saw fighting games almost die out as a genre is due to some kind of fatigue, or better yet, an overload of choices between games that were slightly different, but not quite different enough to get people to move on to the next thing. It may be a bit early to think about this since I've only gotten through half of the series, but I do have to admit that the thought has already crossed my mind. We're finally back to a numbered title. Street Fighter 3 was originally released in 1997, but like Street Fighter 2, got updated versions. The newest version, released in 1999, is the one that I'll be focusing on the most in this video, and its full title is a mouthful. Street Fighter 3 Third Strike Fight for the Future. Let's start with the visuals. This game is beautiful. Full stop. The animations are smooth as butter this time around and incredibly fluid. This is truly one of the highest bars you can hit with 2D artwork in a game like this. Characters are detailed, their clothes move in a stylized and satisfying way, and there's just insanely good artwork everywhere you look. The style has a soft, almost watercolor look where every character looks like they fit right into a painting. For a 90s arcade game that isn't even that far removed from Street Fighter 1, that's wild to me. If you're looking at pure technical achievement, this is the best that Street Fighter has looked so far, hands down. And I say that as someone who really enjoys the alpha art style. On top of this, the overall presentation in Third Strike is like this super industrial vibe with awesome hip-hop themes and a super chill announcer. This makes it feel a lot trendier and modern. Street Fighter 3 nails every single aesthetic choice that it sets out to, and that's not something I can say for most games. For the sake of time, I haven't gone into much detail about the differences between the versions of the numbered Street Fighter games, but this game's presentation completely changed between its first version, New Generation, and the final Third Strike version that I'm playing now. In the first version of the game, there's tons of stylistic differences. The presentation is different, leaning more towards a Street Fighter 2 style of clean menus and mostly vanilla fighting game stuff, even down to the announcer, but I I definitely prefer the third strike aesthetic overall. There is one specific change that I don't prefer though. Defeating an opponent in the original version gives you a neat little dynamic scene with the characters and I absolutely love this little detail. In third strike, these are reduced to a single static image of your character after every round, which is a huge downgrade. Anyways, let's look at the gameplay. In my opinion, the biggest new feature that Street Fighter 3 brings to the table is its addition of multiple super combos, now called super arts, for each character. In the character select screen, you're given the option to choose which super art you want to bring in the fight with you, and this makes every character a bit more dynamic, both in how you can play them and how effective they are in matchups with other characters. Another big new feature is parrying. Parrying lets you completely deflect an attack if you tap a directional input right as the attack lands on you. While standard blocking requires you to hold away from the opponent, parrying requires you to tap toward them, making it pretty risky to use and nearly impossible to abuse with spamming. That risk comes with a pretty high reward if you can master it though, and this is especially true if your name is Daigo Umahara and you're fighting 
in the 2004 EVO Street Fighter 3 Championship, literally a single hit away from losing the match. Additionally, a fundamental change to movement would be introduced in this game, and that's the ability to sidestep forwards and backwards. This change is still present in current Street Fighter games, and is something that you pretty much expect in modern fighting games. I personally love this, and while you can't tell from watching my footage, my muscle memory had me trying to do these little sidesteps in every single previous game. Characters can now use what's called an EX special. Strangely enough, these work very similarly to the powered up specials we saw in the Street Fighter movie game. These can be activated by using a standard special input like a Hadouken, but pressing more than one attack button at once. These power up the special move and make it hurt a little bit more at the expense of some of your super gauge. Now let's talk about the roster. The first release of Street Fighter 3, for some weird reason, completely replaced the character roster with fresh faces outside of just Ryu and Ken. The updated versions added a couple of returning characters, but I imagine almost completely wiping the slate clean had to have been a risky idea, right? It's a minor thing in retrospect, but I do wonder if this affected the success of the game in the long run. Some of the new additions are characters like Alex, who is apparently super important to the story and the de facto main character of 3. To me, he plays exactly how I'd imagine a professional wrestler would play in a Street Fighter game. There's also the introduction of Dudley, and the sole appearance of Q, who actually, I have no idea what his deal is, but he gives off this mysterious film noir detective aesthetic, which I dig. The progression through this game is modified a bit from previous games. After you've selected your character and their super art, you're then given the option to choose between two opponents. Once you defeat that opponent, you're given another two options, so on and so forth. This is an excellent quality of life addition that I didn't even know I wanted. Being able to try an untested character versus an opponent that you're more familiar with or one you're not familiar with does wonders for keeping this game feeling fresh. Plus, with Third Strike having a pretty hefty roster size, it also means that you get to see more of the characters that you want to see. On top of that, the bonus stages are back. The first is another car destruction stage, and it's as satisfying as ever to absolutely wreck this thing. The second stage is a basketball parry stage where balls are thrown at you one at a time and you have to try to parry as many of them as you can. While they are one by one, they're sometimes thrown in bunches, meaning that you sometimes have to parry consecutively to stop them all. Not only is this an excellent way to give players a zero risk opportunity to practice parries, it's also a fun little stage that reminds me a lot of that one Pokemon Stadium hardening minigame. At the end of the game, you fight your character's rival with a short little cutscene beforehand. After that, you get a final fight against Gil. Something that completely caught me by surprise was the fact that Gil has a full, uninterrupted voice dialogue scene when he first appears, which set the tone in a really epic way. The mark of my dignity shall scar thy DNA. Another thing that completely caught me by surprise was this bull. I was so proud of myself for barely scraping by and beating him on my first try, only for him to pull this garbage? In retrospect, it's hilarious, but I wish you could see me scrambling the first time this happened. All in all though, fantastic experience, would recommend. Street Fighter 3's arcade progression is probably my favorite of the series so far. I like the amount of player agency you're given to choose your opponents, let alone the agency you get from simply being able to choose your supers, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So Street Fighter 3 was the beginning of what seemed to be the end for Street Fighter, actually. Even though the game was super well received, it looks like a variety of factors led to the game not being very financially successful. I guess rather than risk another financial dud, Capcom instead decided to wind down the series almost entirely. After this game's third strike release, the next Street Fighter game wouldn't be available until about a decade later. So believe it or not, we're only about halfway into the Street Fighter series. These games so far are considered some of the most classic and well-respected fighting games ever made. So it's pretty wild to me that there's still an entire mountain of games to talk about. That being said, I will be talking about them in part two. Originally, this was gonna be one big video, but I slowly realized that doing so would mean that I have to keep delaying the video since there's so much ground left to cover. I mean, look at the length of this video already. So I hope you'll come back and check out the later games in part two, including Street Fighter VI, which I've already played a ton of. Before I go, I want to quickly talk about this giveaway thing I'm doing. I'm going to be at PAX West in Seattle this September, and you can too. I don't normally do giveaways, but PAX West actually gave me badges to the event to give away to five lucky people in my audience. These badges cover the event from September 1st through the 4th, but don't cover air travel or hotel costs, so make sure you have a way to get there if you enter. In order to enter, all you have to do is fill out the entry form, which I've included in the video's description. You can find all the details and rules in that link too. I'll be drawing the names during a live stream on my Twitch channel, so keep an eye out for that. I'll also be sending emails to the winners too. Until then, thank you so much for watching and I can't wait for you to see part two. And as always, have a fantastic day.